The research focuses on the intersection between the study of medieval literature and texts between 11th and 16th centuries, Chaucer and the digital humanities. She is interested in studying manuscripts and materiality and also works on editorial practices of medieval texts, codicology, paleography, and scribal production techniques. More broadly, she is interested in social and cultural ideas of change as a part of a wider holistic framework for the study of medieval literature. She has published in diverse media such as digital editions and ebooks, as well as in traditional academic forms. For instance, she is the editor of the DD Manuscript, a digital edition of Cambridge University Library, manuscript DD.4.24 of Chaucer's Contembor Contemporary Tales. She is currently working on a project provisionally entitled Paper in Time and Space, a, codicology, a codicologically focused project which reconsiders the significance of paper for dating and localizing the hundreds of paper manuscripts which were produced in England before the advent of print. Her latest books are, as author, Paper in Medieval England from Pulp to Fictions, published by Cambridge University Press, 2020, and as editor, Companion to British Manuscript Studies, co-edited with Elaine Trehan, uh, published as well by Cambridge University Press in 2020. Her talk will be supported by Dr. James Freeman, Medieval Manuscripts Specialist at Cambridge University Library since May uh, 2016 and from March 2022. So just very recently, he has become the principal investigator on Curious Cues in Cambridge Libraries a two-year Wellcome Trust funded uh, digitization, cataloging and transcription project. He regularly teaches the principles of book production and description to undergraduate and postgraduate students in, at Cambridge, and also serves as the meetings secretary for the Association of Manuscripts and Archives in Research Collections and as co-editor of the Transactions of the Cambridge Bibliographical Society. The talk today is entitled Breviaries and Bibles in Cambridge, a show and tell event. Please welcome Professor Darold and Dr. Freeman. Thank you so much for this extremely generous introduction. Um, Maurizio, if I may, uh, it's, it's been, you know, really, <laughs> Um, it's humbling <laughs> to be introduced in this way. Uh, and also thank you so much for, um, to Carla, to Professor Rossi for hosting us tonight for this show and tell. I really want to apologize for this problem with the time zone that for some reason in my head, it was five o'clock in the UK rather than on the call. It's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so but many apologies. So yes, so what, what we thought we would do today is rather than a, a, a lecture or a talk um, on uh, illuminated manuscripts, uh, what we thought we would do is just to show some of the uh, illuminated manuscript that we have at Cambridge University Library here. Um, so as uh, Maurizio mentioned, um, today with me there is James Freeman and you're going to see him in a minute it's just because we have connected the visualizer. Um, the camera is using the visualizer rather than, than looking at us but at the end we will come together again and um, uh, you know as, as uh, Maurizio said James is um, one of the uh, manuscript stars that we have here in Cambridge and if there will ever be the opportunity for you to come and visit um, he is amazing so he will facilitate your your uh, your visit and he will also help you to um, choose the manuscript look after the manuscript he's an amazing colleague who is doing this amazing new project and perhaps I just would like to add that this project 
um, will describe hundreds of manuscripts and will also trans uh, describe and conserve the manuscript containing uh, medieval recipes, but then they will also transcribe all the recipes that usually these are texts that are not well known and also texts that are difficult to find in editions. So he really will make available with this project um, a huge amount of data and will open a new amazing window in medieval medical practices. So really something to watch out. And um, yes, we are all, no pressure, James, <laughs> we, we can't wait. Um, so what, what the manuscripts that we have chosen today um, uh, will somehow be guiding the talk. Um, and we're going to talk through a few features. And of course, if any of you would like to come back later, because this visualizer enable us to turn the page, truly, then we can actually um, maybe go back and I, we can show you more. So I hope that it will also become an interactive talk, not just uh, us telling you um, a few things. So for these talks, we have selected seven manuscripts and I sent a rather belatedly um, a handout to, to Carla that simply gives you the list of the manuscripts. Um, and these manuscripts have been described and um, illustrated, although not completely illustrated, in uh, Binsky Zushi a Western Illuminated Manuscript, a catalog of the collection in Cambridge University Library, which was published in 2011. In that volume, and, and I do have to say that that volume is amazing and is a source, still a source of all sorts of research questions that still need to be explored. But for those of you who haven't seen that uh, the book, let me just tell you a little bit about what the catalog does. So the catalog uh, describe, uh, describes 472 illuminated manuscripts of various provenance. About 287 manuscripts were produced in Great Britain, 73 of the manuscripts there are from France, 58 from Italy, and the remainder from Flanders, Germany, Austria, and the Northern Netherlands. They have all been including, included in the catalog because they contain, to a certain degree, full page miniatures, smaller miniatures, historiated initials, ornamental and minor initials, and border decoration. They constitute, in fact, they, they, they really went through all the corpus of, of manuscript and uh, in the UL and, and they actually are quite an amazing collection of books. So, uh, Given this rich collection, it was a little bit difficult for us to select what to show to you and what we have decided to, 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 to show is um, some of the most famous books, some of the less famous books, and we're going to go through chronologically. We've also decided to focus on books that were produced in Britain rather than um, elsewhere in Europe, um, simply because we thought to give you a sense of um, what you might um, find in the UK. Um, so let's shall we just start with the first book. The first book is uh, the shelf mark is KK425. It is a bestiary or bestiarium. Um, I also, sorry, I also should say that some of the books that we're going to show to you, they have been completely digitized and they are available on the Cambridge Digital Library. And there was also a principle by which we selected some of these books so that if any of you wanted to go and, and, and have a, a deeper look at the whole manuscript, you also had that advantage. So there will be some in the in the digital library and some not in the digital library. So KK425 is in fact in the digital library. Um, this is a manuscript which is famous for its pasture. 
The bestiary, however, is not the complete, um, uh, the complete element of, of the book. It contains all sorts of additional texts from Honorius, Imago Mundi, the famous Epistola, Alexandri. Um, it contains the homilies of Gregorio Mag Magnum, Magnus, um, Hugo de uh, Saint Victor, the Sacramentis, and amongst all of this, there is the bestiary. Um, we had, um, so, but before showing you the bestiary, we wanted to show you this um, image. So I don't know, can you see it? Maybe we can zoom a little bit more. So uh, maybe we need to change screen setting, yes. change view like that uh, and, uh, how can I? so i think full screen maybe... sorry we're just trying to enlarge what you can see ah there, we go. there you are that's why you have the experts in the room <laughs> uh can actually help me so i think i think you, you can actually see this is not um this is just a drawing, but what I thought is, it was interesting is because, of course, you have different staging of drawing techniques here. So you have the angel, the probably or, or the saint, going to, 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 to slay something. Obviously, a later hand has decided to slay, uh, to, to, to slay uh, uh, um, dinosaurs, of course, not medieval. They also decided to, to put in a little shield, not quite sure where from, uh, and there was also the inclusion of the sword. But what you can see here, there is the, 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 the initial trial of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the drawing. And um, maybe if we move the book so they can see the, the yes. So you can see here the, the original, uh, drafting, and then it, the, the, the artist did start to come in and go through with the ink to draw out the full picture. Uh, but you know, these are the sort of treasure that I always love in in manuscript where things are not quite finished. We are here at the end of one of the books, and then of course somebody else thought, let's put in some uh, probably what 19th century could be that drawing of a dinosaur so 18th, 18th yeah. century um dinosaurs when the dinosaurs obviously were considered monsters or <laughs> thereabout anyway this is just a, a little thing that we have on this manuscript but then maybe if we uh move into the uh, actual book the book um as a whole has a fabulous a fabulous range of miniature they range ranging between two to three um um um, height, so almost half page, mini miniature, they have um, line, dr line drawn, tinted, or fully colored images. Sometimes you, you have gilded illustration, um, and some of these uh, miniatures have also been mutilated. So this, um, this image on folio 58 verso, uh, shows a, a shepherd with stick and horn, you can see there. But what is quite interesting is that there is a little bu speech bubble there that says, ha ha, uh, ware le corn. So uh, this is, in fact, one of the first speech bubble in Middle English, even though le, of course, is not Middle English, but uh, ware is Middle, Middle English, um, that we have in, uh, um, in medieval manuscripts. So this, this manuscript was produced probably around 1230, so it's 13th century. Um, it is, um, of course, a manuscript not written in, uh, in, in uh, English. But what is interesting here, and the question that usually I also ask to my student is why would a bestiary um, not written in Middle English uh, have a speech bubble in Middle English, in, particularly, in particular associated with a shepherd. And of course here, we, we, we then start talking about multilingualism in, in England. 
the fact that probably the artist thought that a shepherd might, might only have written, uh, spoken in English, because Latin and French might belong to different um, to a different uh, level of um, uh, lit of, of um, language learning and production. Uh, we can also start to speculate all sorts of things, but then the point is that the person who um, included a speech bubble could also speak Middle English. So, you know, this idea that Latin and French were spoken by certain people and English by the lower strata of society is, is, is really problematizing quite a lot of what it meant multilingualism in medieval England. Um, so anyway, that, just an example to talk, uh, to, to think more about. Then, of course, we have the, um, the unicorn, the, the unicorns that are there, you know, the sleigh um, of the unicorn uh, with the um, uh, lady supporting it, you know, that's, that's quite a classic um, um, uh, miniature that you find also in other texts um, and is there. Um, we then have the tigress who is fooled by the glass sphere thrown by a horseman. Uh, and that, of course, is done um, so that uh, the horseman can steal her cups. Um, and, you know, again, you know, this is all described also in the text. Uh, we then have uh, three gorgons holding the, um, the uh, eye. I think this, this is on 76 first, so. Oh, yeah, that's being, yes. Um, uh, that uh, you can also see the mutilation, of course, here. That happens in all books with pretty images. Um, uh, something that I think is really interesting is the whale caught and killed. That reminds me of um, later texts like Mandeville Travel when they talk about monsters, and probably they were just whales. But um, so this is on. Um, yeah, I see 89 verse. So, sorry, I've, I've included a couple of more images after after James and I went, went through um, the, um, the the book. Um, when you said later text, I thought you were going to say Moby Dick. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it could be Moby Dick as well, but um, I, I, I'll keep it medieval. <laughs> so the interesting thing also about this manuscript is that it was produced, as I said before, around 1230 and possibly in London. It might have some royal provenance. It's apparently, it belonged to James III at some point, but we don't, we don't know. So this is later provenance, of course. Um, uh, but it is mainly, the reason why um, scholars think that this was produced in, in London is because the cycle of illumination uh, is similar to another manuscript um, that was produced, and it is now, Westminster Abbey 22. Textually, uh, this manuscript, and this is something that I haven't mentioned so far, but I think it's perhaps worth thinking about. Textually, this bestiary is close to another manuscript now in Cambridge, uh, that is Fitzwilliam Museum Manuscript 253. But this is possibly a better text. Um, and both texts have been copied from the same archetype. Now, if you look, if you look on the on the cuddle, there is a fantastic introduction actually on the textual transmission and what is known about the text of this bestiary. Um, as a way of, um, of disseminating the text itself. And there are also reference to other manuscripts, just to give you a little bit of a, of a wider picture um, about um, the use of bestiary in the, in the UK. So I would want to refer back to, to the work uh, presented there. 
So the second manuscript, so, and we can all come back and look more, you know, because we have a few manuscripts to go through. So I'll, I'll try to, to go through quite quickly. Uh, so the second one that we selected is um, one of my favorite. Um, it is because it is the only illustrated copy of Matthew pa Paris Le, Le Histoire de Saint Edouard Le, Le, Le Roi. Uh, possibly again made in uh, uh, London, Westminster, around the middle of the 13th century. So we're talking here around 1255. Um, and this is another very possible royal um, uh, book. Not just because it's royal from the illumination, but royal because it, it has been argued by scholars that it was made, that it was um, um, uh, all, um, Oh, the produced. word is gone. Produced, produced uh, for uh, Queen Eleanor of Proven or Province, the que Queen of, of Henry III, for her daughter-in-law, Eleanor of Castile, um, who was um, uh, then the first Queen of Edward I, um, who arrived in England in 1255. Um, it is possible also that this was the book uh, pro, um, that is mentioned in the Royal Wardrobe account in the National Archive that notes that two books were sent out to repair and for rebound during the, king, uh, during, um, the queenship of Eleanor of Castile, so in 1288. So a book produced for Eleanor of Castile, and, uh, but, um, but wanted from Eleanor of Provence, because Eleanor of Provence was um, quite keen on the cult of St. Edward. And the fact that Edward I is called Edward I is probably, there is probably a connection there. Uh, between being a devout uh, follower of, of, of St. Edward and then having the child name in that way. Uh, the, the rubric of the text, sorry, could we just go mm -hmm. at, at the beginning and then we go back to that, yes. The rubric of the text there um, says, La histoire de St. Edward le roi trans, translate, translate de la is based upon Aldred of Rilvo's 12th century Latin life written around the time of the saint's canonization. So we are here talking about 1161. And this copy, as Binsky notes, is a masterpiece of mid 13th century English illumination. Um, sorry, it's a quotation from Binsky. Uh, and he says, the present, uh, the present manuscript preserves vital evidence for the study of, a, of the hygrographical writing about St. Edwards sponsored by Henry III, and also for the complexity and sophistication of English pen and washed narrative art in this period. The only thing I would disagree with Binsky is that this is not about the sponsorship of Henry III. Right. It is about the, spon the sponsorship of Queen Eleanor. And I think it is quite important that in this narrative of kingship or narrative of royal manuscript associated with, uh, with um, the court, um, that what the Queen did um, should be brought in a little bit more uh, and in fact, last week, uh, there was that amazing, uh, amazing talk that also talked about the importance of queens in the delivering of the Bible. So again, um, uh, this is not, of course, a Bible, but there is quite a lot that we should think about. Um, the book il is illustrated with several uh, framed drawings. Uh, and what it tells, it tells the story of St. Edward. Now, St. Edward, is um, Edward the Confessor, who was the son of 
Athelred the Unready and Emma of Normandy. He succeeded Knut, the, um, Knut the Great's son, Halta Knut. And the text tells the story of the Danish invasion, the flying of Emma to Norway with her young son, his return, the coronation, all the way to the Battle of Husting. It is argued that this was a text written by Matthew Paris, uh, although we don't have his um, exemplar. So on folio four, recto, we have Queen Emma leaving for uh, Normandy with her um, sons, Edward, and Alfred, and of course, Edward is um, uh, Edward um, uh, the Confessor. Uh, and you can see there are the two children. Yeah. He's, he's labeled as Edwardulus, yes. like little Edward, which I think <laughs> is rather sweet. Um, we then uh, have um, on folio seven the, the the dream. So Edward will become um, will become king. Uh, yes, can yes. That's it. This is uh, Brithwold's dream, uh, and and the fact that he will actually that Edward will become um, king, uh, blessed by Saint Peter. Um, on folio 24 recto, we have Edward washing his hands with water. And this is a miracle of St. Edward's um, 24 recto, yeah. yeah. Uh, so St. Edward's washing his hand with water, which heals blind men. So the miracle. And then we have the burial of... Um, Edward, yeah, and, and, and you can say Edward um, who died. Um, the defeat a little bit later of, of on 31 recto, uh, there you are, the defeat of the Northumbrian army in this case, um, and on 34 verso, the Battle of Husting. The Battle of Husting, we all know what happened after that. Uh, and finally, opposite to that, um, we have Edward's body and the translation of his body by Gilbert Crispin. Now, I, I will just, I, I'll just, I'll just, pause here because as you can see a lot of these images have been defaced um, we've been talking with James about the possible reason for such uh, outrageous um, <laughs> act of vandalism on, on these manuscripts uh, on these manuscripts and if you look through actually on, on the online um, digital library you will actually see that there is quite a lot of that going on but i like that of washing out like the in, in this case and we were wondering why um james do you want to say one or two things because we we yeah go yeah. for it well there, there are some scenes where um as here um, i think a monk's face has been erased um, scenes where the Pope appears and his face has been defaced. I mean, that hasn't, you know, there's an obvious um, Reformation related reason for that, very much like you would find the word Papa scrubbed out of the calendars um, in books of hours that were owned in England in the 16th century. But clearly there were other scenes where the defacement is more general and and much less specific and also strangely confined or strangely confined to individual figures so it's it's hard to really understand what's going on i think this is the scene yeah. with, the, with the pope yeah um where it, you know in both cases he has been um scrubbed out yeah. but then on the right hand side here the second uh mounted figure um is a monk and he hasn't been 
um, erased, whereas other monastic figures have. Um, for instance, there in this in this um, feasting scene, or or here as well. So it's a little hard to really understand what the what the motivation was was behind this, or even whether it was done by the same hand. Um, we can't we can't be too certain. Yeah, and in particular was that final scene, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, the, the final frame that we that, really. I mean, this has really been obliterated. It's much <laughs> it's much more heavily. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, on the visualizer, it's much more heavily scratched and yeah, scraped. Yeah, yeah. Than other defaced miniatures, which tend to have been sort of washed or or, yeah. or, or down. Um, but yes. Not sure why. It's difficult yeah. to say. Yeah. So uh, again, a mystery. If any of you are working on this, we would love to know. If you know more, please tell us. Um, and uh, uh, it's it just a little bit of of a mystery. Mystery again. Okay. So the next um, the next book that we're going to show is uh, DD four seventeen. Um, it is a 14th century book of hours, and in fact, now we're going to show you just different type of book of hours uh, produced in different places. Um, uh, so this this is an English book of hours, 14th century, as I said, um, with the liturgy according to Sarum. So Sarum, um, the Sarum rite is the liturgy rite developed at Salisbury Cathedral. Uh, it, it starts, the manuscript is decorated with full page miniatures, drawing, calendar miniatures, historiated initial fig, um, uh, figural, ornamental and minor initial, borders, decoration and lines filler. So this is the beginning of the, of the, of the book. It is a, usually a well-known book. Um, there is quite a lot of gold, but what is really interesting, and if you can zoom in, all the work also done on the, the filigran work and, and, and done on the actual uh, gold leaf is quite, um, is quite nice. Can you see? Yeah, 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 they, they can just, see, they can just yes. about see a little bit of, of the work um, done there. Uh, this book is also famous because um, it is known as the Hours of Alice de Redon, ne Remis. Um, he was the she was the wife of Robert de Redon, and possibly she was she died around thirteen twenty three. Uh, but then she the, the book had more than one. Um, owner, but all of this initial work was done probably at the beginning of the 14th century. Um, in the, uh, um, in the, um, shall we show the image of the opening of the, yeah, text. the, opening of the text with her? Mm -hmm. Yes, so this is this is really the beginning of, of the text, and you and and it has been argued uh, that the figure there kneeling in front of Mary with the child is um, Alice. Um, of course, we don't know if that is the case or not. Um, we also don't know exactly what the book was produced. Uh, it seems that it could have um, some Lincolnshire East Midlands uh, features, and they also come from the calendar. But at the same time, the book moved and ended up in East Anglia. So the production is not altogether clear, but what is clear is that this is the work of at least five artists. So we have all the um, prefatory miniature that we saw at the beginning. 
um, if we could just go at the very at the very beginning, sorry, uh, on one verse. So. Yeah. yeah. So this again seems to be uh, seems to be her, Alice, kneeling in front of a bishop. Uh, all of this work uh, is done by an artist. We don't know the name, unfortunately. This is one of the biggest problems that we have when we talk about um, British made books that quite often artists and scribes are anonymous, uh, which um, is not always the case, but it quite often is the case. Um, so this part is, is done um, by the same, or oh, has a style very similar to another very famous Psalter, which is Queen Mary's um, Psalter. And this is um, Royal Manuscript 2B7. Uh, the second artist work mainly on the calendar. So maybe we can just turn pages on that one. There you are. So this is a, a second end and a second artist, um, of which we don't know very much at the moment. Uh, then another artist, so artist number three, does the initial of the hours of the Virgin. Uh, artist number four, the initials of the penitential psalm, psalms, uh, and artist number five does all sorts of borders and marginalia across the book. So this is obviously a well-resourced um, book that brings together a number of artists, um, but this is as much as really we know at the moment about this book. Uh, shall we? I'm, I'm mindful of time, so shall we just move to, to, to the next one? Um, so the next one is another is another book of our DD82. This is not on the um, on 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 the on Cuddle. Um, now this book is another book of uh, with a mixed production. It contains, in fact, two books. We have the Book of Hours, still following the Sarum liturgy, uh, which has been inserted. So you can see here the insertion. So this is the Book of Hours, um, which has been inserted, 13th century, inserted into an obituary calendar that ended up at Kingston St. Michael Priory in Wiltshire. This priory was a Benedictine priory of nuns. The book allegedly was bequest uh, by um, um, John Baker of Bridgewater to the nuns as a whole. And on the actual book, so the, the people who did this obituary uh, that they fill in just this side of the picture, so prepare the layout of the book, uh, is possibly um, uh, John, Elis, and uh, although there is also Thomas, and this is where the two shields come in. So these are the two shields of Thomas and um, John Ely. Now, John Ely was a stationer in London. We know he was involved in 15th century book production. He was, he was a clerk working for the London Bridge between 1452 and 1455. And we also know that Thomas was his nephew. And he also had a brother called William Ellis, who was possibly a printer and a limner. So this is a family of uh, stationers that provided that put together this book probably 
for um, John Baker, and James is going to show you in a minute uh, the fact that John Baker pretty much appear everywhere. Um, oh, yeah. And um, yeah, that's it. And uh, um, it, I think we really think that this book was put together with the hours for the nuns. The intriguing bit now is who wrote the entry for the obit? So if the book arrived at the priory without the entry, and you can see here that there is some feasts that don't have um, any obit. So obviously it arrived, let's say like a form, you know, like a today form that they tell you, fill it in, thank you very much. So now the question is, who filled in the form? Was that done by the nuns? Was then done by uh, male clerics? Now, you do know that, um, as I said before, there is not much anonymity around what um, book production is in the UK. And... Um, very little evidence, we have very little evidence about female scribes. It's, it, it, the assumption, the default assumption is that everything is done by male clerk because women couldn't write, were not taught to write, but they were taught how to read. And here we, you know, this is a question, isn't it, James? Well, I was just, I've just kind of noticed, I've not really looked at this manuscript in very much detail before, but I've just noticed at the bottom of this page, there's a little addition that says, in the days of Dan Catherine uh, Mullins, prioress here, John Baker gave to this house of Minchin Kington a bone of St. Christopher closed in cloth of gold, uh, a noble relic. Mm. Uh, this book for to be their mortal Mortal-ish. image, so their kind of their, their um, record of people's deaths. A book of saints' lives in English, um, a spruce table, and a cupboard um, that be in their parlor. So some furniture, um, a feather bed, a bolster, a pillow, and uh, something else. I can't yeah, quite read. Can't too quite fair, read too yeah. fair, something. Mm. Um, so this this is a record. Oh, I also gave an altar cloth. Um, and various other materials. So this gives you an idea of the kind of testamentary bequest that a benefactor might give to a um, give to a nun in the fifteenth century. Um, I also think that the records of the the obituaries are quite interesting. They give you a sort of range of the sorts of people who gave gifts to these kinds of institutions. So we have um, prayers for the for the souls of Master Richard of uh, oops, sorry I'm off camera prayer for the souls of Master Richard of Abingdon um, uh, for the souls of Julian Bishop um, for the souls of um, Johanna Just, Dington yeah. late prioress here um, but then elsewhere we've got prayers for the souls of more humble people. Let me find an example. Um, there's one somewhere. Um, there we go. We did find some, didn't we? What was this correction? Was oh, yes, the there's, yes, there's a correct. Yeah. Clearly, when the manuscript was being copied, the scribe didn't quite write the right word. So they stitched a piece of parchment over this uh, section of the text. So it says uh, Sancti Lamberti Episcopi, so it's the Feast of St. Lambert um, Bishop, um, but underneath you, you can't see it, but it's, they had originally written St. Remigius. <laughs> so they got their copying wrong. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a really interesting record um, of, well, and people's gifts and benefactions and the, the, the sort of social range of the people who would who would give gifts to a gifts to a nunnery. Um, oh here we go, yes. Let me go, let's see if I can adjust the camera so that you yes. can see. Um, Let me help you, I can help you with 
So, sorry. There we go. Yeah, so, for apology. the souls of Johannes Kinman husbandman, so, you know, an ordinary um, husbandman, farmer, peasant farmer, um, and then next to him on the same day, et pro anima domine Alicia ha. Um, so there's multiple hands adding entries to this register over mm. a period of time. Mm. And the fact that it was, you know, that this was intended for practical use, it's, it's a specific bit of the Book of Hours that's included mm. here. It's, and as you can see from the rubric, which says commendatio anime. Mm -hmm. So this is, the, this is the order of the dead. Mm -hmm. So the part of the liturgy that you would perform um, at mass services for the deceased. So it's both a kind of practical record as well as a, as a sort of functional liturgical book. Um, I rather like that conjunction of the two things together. Mm -hmm. um, this was definitely definitely a book that sometimes we talk about uh, things coming together casually. You know, it seems that some you know books are just agglomeration, other or coherent text, or they're just coming together by chance. But this, I think, was a book that was put together with a purpose. So it was bespoke to a certain to a certain extent to um, perform a, a specific. Um, role. I think I think the way as well that we we study medieval manuscripts, we tend to want to sort things into categories mm -hmm. and sort certain kinds of books into certain sort of intellectual categories. So a liturgical book is definitely used in church. A record is definitely used in some kind of administrative context. Uh, chronicle is used in a in another context again. But actually, really, what we have in this manuscript is is a a kind of material demonstration that medieval readers didn't think about their books in that way and that the book could be a much more fluid and flexible object than than the book may even be today because we we get our books ready made the book is is just a fixed and static object in the in the modern period I, i'm sure there's going to be a modern bibliographical scholar to jump up and down on me for saying that <laughs> but it's it's very much the case in the medieval period that they are fluid and flexible and dynamic objects that people were quite prepared to customize and yeah. rearrange to suit their purposes yeah uh, so just we are going to show you that so this was the one we wanted to spend a bit more time on so now there are still three books very quick um to to show you um e114 um so this is another book of our produced in london and then augmented uh in burlison and um burlison edmund so um uh, this is the first um uh opening that definitely uh seems to have a London um, uh, origin. So full gold frames with interlaced foliage in blue, rose, orange. Um, um, and it seems to be connected uh, with the circle of Johannes and Hermes Scher. This work is also seen in style. Uh, for example, the Neville's Hours, I don't know if you ever heard of that, uh, from Berkeley Castle. And it, this type of work and this art, it has, artist has been commented by Scott in the later Gothic manuscripts. Um, but then at the end of the book, we have um, a slightly different type of style. Here now we are moving to Burris and Edmund um, around 1440. So the early part was the beginning of the 15th century, this part is 1440. In fact, you can actually see the monks, the monks there, different range of color scheme, um, but still within you know, the same idea of the frame um, and the use of the golden leaf. What is also interesting is that not only here we have two books coming together, but we also have a recipe. We do, yes. <laughs> so um, we had to have recipe in there. So as Orietta mentioned, this um, project that we're about to start at the University Library here in Cambridge is going to be looking at um, medical recipes. So not only um, compilations of recipes um, in what we might describe as receptarian manuscripts, but also 
manuscripts that are not medical, but which contain uh, medical recipes written on their peripheries, on their fly leaves or on their margins. Um, to give people a full sense of the uh, material as well as intellectual context in which this kind of knowledge was, was transmitted and recorded and disseminated. Um, and it's, I mean, this is not a medical recipe, um, and I'll explain why in a minute, but it's, it's interesting in just the same reason, you know, that this is clearly a, it's a book of hours, it's used for, you know, the performance of somebody's personal, private, devotional routines to take with them to mass and read from. Um, it's also got a lot of prayers written into it on the on the page opposite. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of extended prayers. You know, this one begins, O bone Jesu, O dulcissime Jesu, O Jesu fili, Marie virginis plainis, etc., etc., etc. But then rather more mundanely, at the bottom of the facing page, we've got a recipe um, to slay rats. <laughs> um, so you take salt arsenic um, and sugar, um, take rose alger, which is um, arsenic disulfide, and then wheat flour cake. Um, and then presumably you, you mix them together and, um, you know, the rats rather like the sugar and the wheat flour, but they, they don't respond too well to the arsenic. Um, now I've got, a, I've got an allotment and I occasionally have problems with mice and rats eating my vegetables. So maybe I need to try you this recipe try and uh, see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, great. So the, uh, and the next book is another book of our, um, that um, um, these, in this case uh, has been localized to the East Anglia um James is going to to, to show maybe maybe a couple of obits um so um we know pretty much the connection the connection is uh with the Coleman and the Edward family it's been produced between the um, end of the 14th century beginning of the 15th century um and then there is a an exquisite initial that I want to show you later on, uh, because I really would love to hear more if any of you have got experience with that, with those sort of initials. Um, so do you want just to, uh -huh. uh, to, sh to show a couple of things from the ca um, calendar? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, just to um, see that, uh, of course, this is how sometime Book of Hours can be pinned down to provenance and ownership because they have these fantastic calendars that tell us information, give us information about family and people. The books of hours were very customizable. Um, they were really, I suppose, the first books that were ever mass produced for a for a broad readership. You find evidence in the 14th and particularly in the 15th century of them being produced um, on spec rather than by commission. And people, they would, and the copyists would produce calendars that were specific to local areas that included the saints particular to that local area. So calendars are very valuable for helping us to localize, um, not necessarily the production, but the reception um, of a particular book of hours. Um, and it was not unusual to find that people wrote um, the um, birthdays or death days of their family and relatives um, in these calendars. So we have at the top here, Obitus Aliciae. So, um, you know, the death of um, Alice, my wife, uh, and then further down, um, Obitus Margarete Coleman, Anno Domini, Millesimo, um, Quattrocentesimo, um, I, I won't. 50, 50 uh, 90. Uh, sorry, 94. Um, so, um, and then another one here, John Coleman, um, who died on the 11th day of May, um, 1495. Um, so you get a sense of this book being um, kept within a family, handed down, here we go, the death of Thomas Edward and Cecilia, his wife, they died on the same day, which makes you ponder why. And there's a very good example on the Cambridge Digital Library manuscript II62, the so-called Roberts Hounds. Um, that was made, I think, in the earlier part of the 15th century, mm -hmm. but by the 16th century, 
it's come into the hands of the Roberts family who um, write their name all over that manuscript. And there are multiple records of family members' birthdays or death days um, in that book. Anyway. Great. Uh, and just to show you the, 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 the type of artistic um, decoration. So, you know, um, here is the matin, the, the matin, the matin I? Um, uh, blue um, rose initial D on a blue and rose uh, ground containing the annunciation. So you can see the annunciation there and then the decoration. And then on folio 22 recto, there is this uh, amazing thing. So it's um, a gold initial with pen ink work in purple. Now, from a British production point of view, this is quite an unusual decoration. Uh, because, you know, red and blue or doodle, you know, th th those are the colors. The, the gold and the purple is unusual to me. So I was telling James, we need to have a database that collects all of these uh, specific instances of uh, gold with purple, because I think it does have something to do with production. So the place of production and probably it must be, it, it could potentially be an East Anglian association. So there are lots of manuscripts, for example, that contain that little decoration and usually those manuscripts are also localized in London. But anyway, I don't know. I just, I just, saw, I just thought I'll show it to people that maybe work more on illuminated manuscript. And if you come across also as a practice somewhere else, I'd love to hear. Um, a colleague of mine told me it's also something to do with um, the humanistic influence in uh, Britain, uh, but I'm, I'm just putting it there, not as a solution, but as a question. If you saw any of these examples in, in other continental manuscripts or British manuscripts. And finally, we are going to, finish the, um, the show and tell with, um, with the classic um, book on the, the sex Alice Kerubin. So, uh, you know, memory and uh, the, 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 uh, the way in which memory, logic, rhetoric should help us to think through um, how to retrieve memory. This is not one of the most well-known books of, um, of, of, of with this um, uh, diagram and illustration. And in fact, Mary Carrada, um, in her great article where she actually discussed the, the function of the, cherub, uh, the cherubins um, uh, to retrieve mnemonic exercises, um, she doesn't mention this manuscript. So that's why I thought I might um, just um, um, show it to you. So this is MM533. Uh, um, it contains, you know, from this, this text, Alanus de Insulus de Sex Alice Cherubim. It also contains the Ocusculo Sacerdotio and the Speculum Sacerdotum. So, the connection is there, uh, and I think with this, I'll close the, the show and tell. Uh, thank you very much again for listening to us, and um, if you have any questions or you want to, to see something else, please let us know, and we will um, try to show it to you. <laughs>